next on Two Counselors and a Mic. Someone saw me. They saw me at the elementary level. They didn't see me in the middle school level. They didn't see me until my late years in high school. And then I just had people continue to support that higher education. And then life happened and I didn't know what to do when someone saw me again and just helped me that space. And so from those places, I want to see people in the highs and the lows and in all of it. I wanna be a manifestation of all those that have seen me. Thanks for landing on our podcast, where we use the power of our collective stories to make change in the world by expanding our understanding of who we are and how we learn. We're a podcast dedicated to exploring the ever-changing topics related to education. My name is Lisa Johnson Davis, and I am a counselor focusing on how we learn. And my name is Gabriela Baeza Delgado. I am a counselor interested in maximizing our collective ideas to support all students. Welcome back to Two Counselors and a Mic. I'm Lisa. And I'm Gabby, and we're glad you've tuned into our ninth podcast. In this episode, we'll hear from Linda and Robert Guerrero, a couple that is making a difference in the lives of young people. But before we introduce our guest, Lisa, I wanted to share a quote with you and get your thoughts uh, by a pretty famous person, Robert Frost. And the quote is, I am not a teacher, but an awakener. What are your thoughts? Dramatic pause. Oh my gosh. (laughs) That's a counseling technique. (laughs) Is that? Yes. It is. Dramatic pause. Make sure that you listen. Listening skills are great, but I'm just kind of in shock and awe with Robert Frost. Oh my, my gosh. I am not a teacher, but an awakener. When I think about awakening, what are you awakening in that person? And I immediately, excuse me, I immediately think about potential, Mm. the potential of uh, the person. Like you're, you're born and you're this little baby and you are so innocent in the world, but you're like this blank slate of, you know, you're just going to be like, like, let's say a baby was our artificial intelligence, you know, like we're sent here and this is, this is the AI and all it is born to do is to like take in experiences and make meaning. And through that process, it's a, you know, that child is awakened Mm -hmm. over its lifetime to be who, whomever it's supposed to be. I love that. I love that quote. What do you, what are your thoughts, Gabby? Yeah. When I, you know, I love quotes. I keep books of quotes and I, I always like to have them on my desktop just as a nice, nice reminder of, of positivity. So when I came across this one, I actually hadn't read it before and I thought, oh, I, I'm familiar with Robert Frost's work. And so I, I, I thought, how come I hadn't um, seen this one before? But same as you, I thought, you know, not a teacher, but an awakener. And I thought, oh, what an interesting way to look at the roles that we have. Because sometimes in education, um, people seem to get caught up uh, with their titles quite a bit. I think that's, that, that just naturally happens. You know, people work very hard for their, their credentials and their degrees. And, but sometimes I feel like a title, when we think of the, 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 the description teacher, most people think of someone who's in the classroom and who's gone through that traditional credentialing program. I, that hasn't been my experience. I, I went the uh, counseling route and have done um, quote unquote teaching in a different way. So when I see the quote, I think it's not about looking at ourselves from that perspective, but as people that can potentially tap into that potential, like you said. Um, So as opposed to saying, you know, I'm a counselor or I'm a therapist or I'm a principal. No, we are awakeners because you are planting these seeds. Oftentimes with our kids, we have them for a year or two and we may not see them ever again sometimes. And so you think, oh, I hope it's stuck. I hope that, you know, the valuable lessons that they learned and, um, you know, the, the skills that they picked up in our class or in our group really come to fruition. But sometimes we don't get to see the fruits of our labor oftentimes. And so I think part of, you know, this quote saying, you know, you're an awakener is that's really getting to the root that helps define a person 
It's you can, you know, do that by introducing someone to a particular genre of, of um, history or music. And you think, oh my goodness, they tapped something inside of me that I had never thought that I would be interested about or intrigued to learn more about. And, and you don't know what's going to stick with each kid, right? And you just hope, okay, this might be something. And you just tap into that potential that's there. Think of some of the, the guests that we've had. Oh. Like Gabe, right? Starts off in one path, ends up you know, with his own company being a producer and amazingly talented. And uh, again, someone planted that seed there and that was awakened in him, right? Yes, it, it just makes me think about just society as a whole. And, you know, we're, we're looking at not only thinking about learning in a different way, but we're trying to reimagine, you know, lots of our structures, you know, and especially our young people are, are asking these really thought-provoking questions. Why? You know, why is it like this? And when you trace it back, I think we didn't know a lot of things, you know, talking about, you know, going back in time and thinking about how science created and the wonderful books of literature and how we were kind of awakening as human mm -hmm. beings. But it had to be really reductive back then because we, we couldn't understand everything. So we had to say, okay, here, let's develop language. Let's develop numbers. You know, let's say that there's laws of physics and 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 all of those things but right now it's like we're in a time where we have to be so expansive and that expansion is really what you're saying is a, as awakening mm -hmm. like we have to awaken to the idea that like you you were mentioning we're more than the the labels that we give ourselves mm -hmm. And that in giving ourselves these labels, like we've talked about, we don't fit in any place. It's there is that need right now to be liminal in the sense that you transverse many different identities. And if you ask somebody, inevitably, as our guests, they do translate, a, you know, across different identities, language, experiences, you know, it's, it's, that's transformative. And when you even think of comparing that to our educational system, there are different ways of accessing the potential, whether it's outdoor education and being in a, a schoolyard mm -hmm. outside. There's the mentorship that we've really heard a lot mm -hmm. from, from our stories. And there's just so many coaching and being you know, into that sports piece. There's so many ways that you can connect with kids wouldn't it be beautiful if we could reimagine learning where we all came together in this like mass awakening of who we are, which is like, what is at the root, Gabby, across a teacher, a counselor, an administrator? What is at the root of all of what we do? Why do we do it? That's my big why, my big question for you right now. <laughs> oh, that's a big question for go. me. <laughs> why do we do it? You know, I think... Part of me feels like it's in our nature to want to be in community with people and 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 learn and listen and those skills can be refined, um, you know, over time. But I do think if we you know trace back history, you look at we've always actually done learning that way. Uh, we came along <laughs> recently and and really changed things. But if you really trace the way. Um, you know, a lot of indigenous groups in particularly have always done their, their teachings and their learnings. It's always been in this way of, it's not about, you know, imparting all of this knowledge because I know more. It's about your own personal growth, learning through stories, learning through being in community, learning through being with family. And yeah. so that awakens these senses and this knowledge, right? And that is a, a form of education. It doesn't come with those specific titles that were so oftentimes hung up on, but you think, but that's not what's important. What's important is that, um, that level of growth that someone can develop that can come from, um, like I said, connecting with your family, uh, understanding your roots, where you come from, spending time in community uh, with others. Um, that's where that true awakening comes. But I think we're, we're all just kind of naturally driven to want to learn and connect where our brains are wired to want to connect with one another. So love it. I, I am speaking of connection. I'm really excited to hear about 
um, the story of Linda and Robert Guerrero, who are married. And this will be our first interview of a, a couple's interview. So really looking forward to hearing about their mutual journey. And now our special guest. Welcome, Linda and Robert, to Two Counselors and a Mic. We're so glad to have both of you here. Um, before we dive in, if you wouldn't mind so our listeners know a little bit about you, could you each maybe just share quickly the, the current role that you're in or roles that you've been in for work? So it kind of sets up a little bit of the context or your background mm -hmm. uh, so we get to know you a little bit better before we dig a little deeper. So I've been in education for the past 24 years. Um, I started as a bilingual teacher and I've gone and proceeded to teach at middle school. And then uh, 15 years ago, I got involved in administration at the high school level as an assistant principal. And then as a principal of an elementary school and then coordinator of migrant and ELD students. And then a director of English language development for districts in North County. And I'm currently as a teacher and intervention resource specialist, part-time teaching English language, English learners, as well as supporting all teachers in professional development of strategies to engage all students with a focus on engaging English learners in the classroom at a middle school in North County. Wonderful. Thanks, Linda. What about you, Robert? Yeah, so I would uh, class my, classify myself as a, like a community coach slash mentor. I've done that for about almost 20 years. I was also a high school basketball coach, coaching girl. So uh, developed my leadership skills there. Um, from there, I worked in different nonprofits, such as our local uh, church, as well as uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside, and really kind of just grew a passion for um, not only developing youth, but developing teams and healthy cultures. And then right now, currently, I uh, launched a business about a year ago called Beautiful Warrior Services. It's a mentoring community and school-based mentoring. And I'm kind of taking the lead on that at, the, at this point right now. Wow. Well, we're definitely going to want to know more about that. Uh, but uh, Lisa and I always start with a big question for all of our guests, and that's the, um, the big what's your why type question. And so, um, you know, I've known both of you for several years, but really trying to, to learn more about you on that deeper level as far as kind of what, what was it that prompted you to to choose a path in serving youth and or in specifically serving in education. So um, we're kind of curious, what's your why? What, what, what was it that led to kind of where you are today? For me, someone saw me and um, they saw me at the elementary level. They didn't see me in the middle school level. They didn't see me until my late years in high school. And then I just had people continue to support that higher education. And then life happened and I didn't know what to do when someone saw me again and just helped me that space. And so from those places, I want to see people in the highs and the lows and in all of it, I want to be I want to be a manifestation of all those that have seen me. And I think the example I saw growing up worked. I knew at a young age that I wanted to play school and I wanted to teach. And, but I realized that the influence that you have as a teacher has also become the mentor and the coach and living life with people. So my why is I want to help young students, young adults, men and women to become the best of themselves because people have allowed me and empowered me to become the best version of myself that I ever imagined I would be where I'm at today. But people saw, saw in me greatness before I saw it in myself. So I wanna pull that out of each young woman and young man that I come in contact with. Wow, thanks Linda. Robert. My why's kind of similar to my, to my wife's, um, I think how we got completely different but i think same thing with me my why is definitely pulling out the gold in in um people that um maybe hasn't hasn't been tapped into i think everybody has potential and these gifts and talents inside of them and a lot of times that's not not developed so growing up i 
I was the opposite. I really didn't have, I didn't have that. I, you know, I played sports, but I didn't have a coach that like empowered me. I, I, I was a good student, but I, I didn't have a teacher that mentored me. So I, I, I sifted through the cracks as I navigated to co coaching. I, sports played a big role in my life. And so I began to see um, these young people were coming, um, looking for what I thought was to be invested as, as an athlete, but they just want somebody to see them and value them and care for them and, and, and believe in them. And so that um, reminded me of, man, what I would have been if somebody would have helped me. And so I just kind of fell in love with that and just began to dedicate my life to help people. I'm wondering, just hearing you, I'm just like light bulbs are going out for me. And I think, you know, even our, our work as counselors, you know, we're always thinking about that in terms of the mentorship and sense of belonging from your journeys. If you, if you would, if you would share, like how, how were your journeys as, you know, moving from a child, you mentioned something, Linda, that just struck me as like that you weren't seen in middle school. So I'm wondering if, if you could navigate us a little bit about kind of your background of maybe where you are coming from, um, how your journeys intersected would be, you know, wonderful just to see, you know, how you were kind of brought together in the same kind of purpose that you have. When I was in middle school, tracking was in place. And so I was tracked as a non-college prep and I wanted to be in college prep, but my eighth grade teacher wouldn't place me in college prep. And so I went into high school, uh, not on the college prep with uh, a classmate, um, my junior year took college prep. And then um, my teacher was like, you can go to college. She talked about an SAT and I didn't know what an SAT was. I'm first generation born here. My parents immigrated here from Mexico. My dad went to the second grade. My mom went to the fifth grade. Um, and so Education was important. They wanted us to be educated, but they didn't know how to empower or navigate. So then I had teachers at the high school that saw me and, and coached me up on what I needed to do. So I had to retake a lot of classes my junior year and I got admitted to Beach State conditionally. Um, and I still have my acceptance letter that says conditionally admitted um, because I didn't have the high enough math or the high enough English. Um, and my math teacher uh, tutored me in the summer so that I could pass the math placement and uh, then took the, then I took the below level English and then I proceeded to become a double major and a minor and uh, got into education and then just started seeing kids in the classroom that, you know, just there was a connection. You knew they needed something. And I've always said um, my kids were my first, my students were my first kids because I didn't have kids till later. And so I would have slumber parties in the classroom with the students. They would come over to the house and we would have parties with the kids. I traveled out of state to visit my students. I've been at my students' weddings. And so there was just this, this it wasn't just the class or things outside that I did with these students. And then Robert and I met, I was a high school assistant principal and he was a football coach and we met at a football game. And we met a bet, bet on the game and then we started courting each other and then ended up dating. And then we started swapping kids. Like I would refer a student to him. He would refer a student to me. And then we started hosting Fab Fridays in our home before we were even married. We just, we used the house as a place for five local high schools charter schools and Christian schools and public schools. And we opened up the home for video games, food, movies. And because he was a coach and I was a, an administrator, parents trusted to in, give us their kids for an evening of games and just fun. Mm -hmm. And so those kids started 13, 14 years ago. And from there, we've branched out to mentorship in marriage, pregnancy, loss of pregnancy, finances, buying houses, breaking up, careers. And that's kind of been how we ended up together. And it wasn't like a, you have to want a mentor. That wasn't a thing. It just kind of evolved. And we both had that same heart for mentorship and for kids. How about, how about you, Robert? If you can repeat the question. <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> just 
what you know your journey as that as that child that young person you know your background and then how you guys met you know your thoughts on that yeah so uh, as i said earlier i wasn't really i well maybe i was but i didn't feel i was seen and for me at a young age i kind of noticed i was a pretty good athlete and so i knew that was a way to kind of receive some type of affirmation, encouragement. Like I I wasn't really getting that, you know, my mom cared for me, but you know, she was working, trying to do the best she could. My, my father passed away when I was, my stepfather was in the military. So I just kind of was passed by, but when playing sports was something that made me feel good, made me feel accomplished, made me feel, you know, and so school I was good at, but I wasn't one of the, we had gates, gate students when, when I was young. And so I wasn't a gate student. I wasn't a you know, and so for me, it just really, I, I gravitated towards sports for the life lessons that it taught me, the the adversity, the cultural diversity, all those things I just, that I was yearning for, I, I, I really kind of was drawn to sports. Um, and so at a young age, I think I was like 20, I was like 21 when I started coaching. I just fell, I just, long story, but I fell into it and started feeling like a purpose beyond myself and, and investing in other people for versus just trying to find myself and who I was, I felt purpose and like listening to a young person. I'm like, man, instead of like using it as a crutch, like what I didn't have, you know, I was using it as motivation. Well, I didn't have it, but that's okay. Everybody has stuff and don't use that to hold me back. Use that to help, help pull people up, you know? So I dove into coaching and like Linda talked about evolving in mentorship. I evolved as a coach. Cause at first I was a player's coach. I just wanted to like be cool. And then I realized the platform I kind of had and what these kids were really yearning for wasn't to be popular to be good athletes. It was just, you know, somebody to, like I said, care for them and, and value them and, and see them beyond the gifts and talents that they were. And I started seeing, you know, um, a lot of people were talking at kids, teachers were talking Kids, parents were talking at kids, coaches were talking at kids, but nobody was really listening to what these, some of these kids were really dealing with. And so I began to kind of just be intrigued by just helping people. And so like Linda said, then I was coaching when I met her and, uh, you know, I, I felt I was a good coach at the time. But when I met Linda, it's like, we kind of sharpened each other and I got to kind of glean and learn from what she was doing as an administrator, as a teacher and vice versa versa, you know, my rapport with these kids and how I related to them, we kind of, kind of made each other better. Um, so that was what, like 14 years ago, we kind of started, started that. And so, yeah. Time flies, doesn't it? Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I will say you two are like magnets because mm-hmm. kids, Lisa, they just find a, they just gravitate towards them, whether they're on a campus or putting together a conference or whether it's a sport event, you're these magnets, um, wherever you go, you have a following. And Mm -hmm. I I know, uh, Lisa, you were, uh, Linda, you were talking about how you've uh, really mentored and coached these young people that are now adults. And now you get to see them on this whole other side. And what a, what a treat, because oftentimes when we're in the classroom or as counselors, or even as coaches, Robert, maybe you have kids for maybe a year or two and you think, Oh, I planted good seeds. And and I hope that that seed gets nurtured and it's watered, but we don't always get, have the, the luxury of seeing our students grow up and, and you really do because you're so entrenched and um, committed in your community. So I'm just curious, what have the young people you've worked with taught you? What are lessons you've actually learned from them? Um, this was the, the probably the hardest year of my life in a long time. This last year, my position was cut. I was in the middle of a dissertation. Uh, injustice at work was happening. And for after 15 years in education, getting a March 15th notice that you don't have a place in the organization. And when your mentees become your mentors and giving you hope and giving you the same talk that you've given them, I think it's one of the most beautiful things about mentorship. And that's why my life is so blessed because when the mentee becomes the mentor, because we've never, Robert and I have never tried to tell our kids that life is perfect. And to be a graduate of a doctoral program and not have a job 
that is equivalent to that as, by societies, right? Mm -hmm. um, what society says, but to know your identity, that's one of the things that I've been able to speak to my kids that look at, I'm here and I did, I played the game and even it's still hard. So they teach us the mirror of don't just give it to them and not be yourself. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's that role reversal that has been one of the most beautiful things that they've taught us. And also I'm very humble when they choose to live in relationships in a mentoring relationship or a coaching relationship, because you can want to mentor. We've wanted to mentor so many and they just don't want it or they think they can do it on their own. But when they, they choose to sit on the couch or they choose to get on the call, that for me is very humbling um, that they want to better themselves and they, and they choose you mm -hmm. to help them. I would say for me, they've def definitely taught me a lot. They've taught me how to be a better father, a better husband, um, and to be patient. And I think you said something when we started this, you're like, just, just be yourself, be natural. Don't be rehearsed. They've taught me that too. They, because people, kids, especially young people, they can see, see through all that stuff, the words that are just put out there and, but there's nothing behind it. There's no follow through. And so they've taught me how to be consistent and be a man of my word and, um, remind me you know, to always keep the main thing, the main thing, like the relationship is the most important thing, not the progress or the grades or that that's all important, but um, just the relationship, that that is the number one important thing to maintain the relationship that they're cared for. So they definitely have taught me how to be a better person. And um, like Linda said, to be transparent and not just preach at them and say, oh, I, I know this, I know that, but like, here's, here's what I'm struggling with. And that's hard for, that's hard for a lot of people to do. It's easy to kind of like share expertise, but when you have to kind of be vulnerable and open yourself up and, you know, but I've learned like, that's, that's what they're looking for, authentic relationships that people that can just be themselves around them um so that that what i would say i've learned and if i can just add something um one of the things that we've always done is really um the mentorship experience is two-way we bring in our stuff just as much as they bring in their stuff we don't try to portray perfection so I think that that's one of the things that we always want to be very transparent and very authentic with our, our mentees and be able to live life with them. That's one of the things that we call, you know, mentorship is living life with someone. Two-way street, you said. Yeah, two-way street. I wanted to just dive deeper a little bit into um, what you were talking about with being seen and then thinking about the, the mentees that you have, like, what is that specifically when you use that word being seen? What, it, what does that mean for you? So um, there was this conversation that I had in one of my classes that that talked about creating a culture of welcome in your classrooms and in your departments and in your school sites. And I took a lot away from that because they said, how do you know when you're being seen? What manifests itself when someone's seeing you? And then they went the opposite and they said, how do you know when you're not, when it's not a culture of welcome, right? A culture of welcome is being seen, a culture of not, of unwelcomeness is not being seen. And I realized that for me, not being seen is one of the most horrible things for me, that it, it messes with me in a deep level. And so I took from that experience and I've made this one of my mantras, to see someone is the most humanistic thing you can do. And to not see someone is the most dehumanizing thing you can do to someone. And so I always try to see people. And so whether it's at Costco or at the airport, I have these random things I like to give away to people and I like to give words of affirmation and, um, because what the person does when they receive a word of affirmation or when you see them or when you pause at a check stand, they don't know what to do with themselves because no one does that. So it has been something that has changed me and it has changed the way I enter a building, the way I engage with people. I always try to be present. I never have my phone when I'm with people because I'm present, you know, and I want to be in the moment. And so that is something that when to see people is where all that stems from. That's amazing to me. 
I'm kind of speechless because I feel like you're my soul sister right now. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I, I think about the power differentials a lot too in mentorship. And when you were talking about, you know, risking and, and trusting and belonging, like I, I wonder too, how you guys think about just the, these inherent structures that we have in education as a whole, you know, in the four walls that you kind of start with some of those things already. And how do you, how do you go about personally, professionally creating those spaces for kids where they are able to trust they, and they, you know, they have the authenticity, like, what are your thoughts about how do you do that? What's the magic? uh, Yeah, I'll I'll jump in. My, my my, uh, classroom is a little different because traditionally I'm a coach. I've been on campuses for sure, you know, and I think, It doesn't take a lot, I think, to answer your earlier question for me, like the being seen is to define that for me is the the voice. Everybody has a voice. And a lot of times that's not allowed to come out for multiple reasons, you know, home environment, kids confidence, whatever it may be, but it's not really developed. So then kids don't know how to express themselves. They don't know how to share feelings. They don't know how to talk, especially nowadays with the culture we live in with social media and texting, like they're, they're bottled up. And then I think um, additionally, like it's, it's not seeing them from the outward appearance and what they could become, but like what's, what's inherently inside of them. He's a good person, a caring person, you know? So for me, I always try to, I try as best as possible because there's really no formula because it's fluid. Classrooms change and times change and master schedules and all that. But I think it's, making the making the main thing the main thing and making sure that I'm consistent and really trying a lot of time to build relationships whether it's team building whether it's kids getting to know one another because I'm one person so if I have a, a room full of like 20 kids for me to do it, it one-on-one individually that's not really going to happen there's just not time but if I create environments where the students are getting to know one another now they're getting tools so it's not just me the master teacher that is a, doing this, they're getting skills where they can do it with one another. So they're practicing interviews. Hey, how, you know, ask three questions and, and listen and, and ask probing questions and don't listen, don't just listen to the words, listen to the meaning behind what they're trying to say. So just little things like that. So always try to embed that in a lot of the curriculum you write. We try to embed that, that that's a core piece of whatever it is we're doing, whether it's a practice or whether it's a social and emotional uh, lesson, we always try to embed some type of relational interaction in there. So that way the students begin to see like, this is, this is a value because we keep, we keep doing this. And I think if I can just add to that, I think there's a humility um, that sometimes doesn't happen with working with students. The power struggle of the position, Gabby and Robert both have known me as an assistant principal and then just kind of move through, you know, the career ladder. But to me, I've always said, I'm just a girl, right? I'm just a girl that gets to do a job for eight hours a day, but who I am outside of that profession is really who I am. And so I think the humility, kids know humility and kids know positionality and power. And I I think that to me, Miss Lisa, that would be the key thing is the humility of how you engage with students to create that safe environment that they will open up to you because they know you're not dominating them, your eye level, or even at times beneath them. I sometimes, my, 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 our kids that we mentor, they can't believe how old I am, right? Because I try to be cool all the time, you know? And I think it is that re- relationality and not that positionality, right? That, that is really the key to uh, having these relationships with um, students so that they feel that they can open up to you. If I could add to, I think it's on top of that, it's being consistent with that. Cause if it's just a one-time deal, walls are up or it's just being consistent where walls eventually melt, walls go down where the kids see, okay, I can trust that person. Cause we can be as cool as we want and do all these activities. But a lot of times people have walls up. They don't want to be vulnerable. They don't want to share. So after a while, when, when uh, people start saying this is really who they are, consistency is really important too. And I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, being authentic and being yourself, like this is who you are and right. you're not trying to front, right? That this is you. 
all the time. I'm just curious, what has that been like during COVID um, and connecting or trying to keep those connections going? What were some of the challenges that you encountered uh, with the young students or young adults? I shouldn't say they're not all young, young adults that you've been mentoring. What has that been like? Yeah, I think I can I can start because I was at running a program at a local high school in March and it was supposed, supposed to end in uh, the end of the school year and it got chopped right in the middle of it. So that was, to be honest, was a little difficult because we were used to seeing kids face to face weekly and talking to them. And so trying to get students on technology, trying to get them, um, they had a lot, some of them going on at home, some of them, whether it was technology issues, whether it was just not being wanting, not wanting to let me into their house, right. For whatever reasons via zoom. And so that, that, that was tricky navigating, but I began to see like this need where kids just wanted to connect because they were so disconnected. I mean, that was a core part of their life was, was built around school and, and, and relationships and that was cut from them. So just making sure that I was consistent, whether it's reaching out and finding different ways, like Zoom doesn't work for everybody, but a text might or a phone call might. And so, so just like with our kids, it's like just finding ways to work and to, to, to try a little more. And so it definitely took a little more work, but it, it paid dividends and, and um, it was definitely something that I know kids needed. And then I think personally in our, in our lives, the kids that we have mentored throughout the years, we begin to see like this need, people were going through stuff. So jobs and kids out of school and, and a lot of times they didn't have anywhere to talk. And so, because people were so, I think are, are so they're at home, they're on each other. So people get on each other's nerves or problems that were maybe weren't they were there, but they, they could be avoided because somebody was at work or somebody, they started to kind of creep up more. So we, I know Lynn and I be over the last three or four months, we've definitely seen a spike in just people that need support, the place to talk, to, you know, somebody to talk to. And so, um, you know, that's from the students to like some of the other people we're mentoring, we've definitely seen there's a need for human interaction. There's a need for community. There's a need for the touch or the, or the listening ear. There's a, there's a need that is, that is kind of been cut right now. For me, I was I was uh, supporting at a school site when COVID happened. So I started mentoring teachers uh, via Zoom. Uh, teachers that got let go because they were t- long-term subs. Teachers that were really vulnerable that this was hard for them, that they were struggling because COVID was a trigger for other things that they hadn't dealt with. Right. So um, the, I, the, you sometimes can ignore your stuff when you're busy. Right. And then not being busy. There was a lot of stuff that came to the surface. So I was doing a lot of Zoom uh, mentoring. I had not I hadn't done a lot of Zoom. Mentor- I'd never done Zoom mentoring <laughs> before. And I started doing Zoom calls and mentoring people through creating a structure, identifying where, where is that pain or where is that anxiety coming from? creating a routine for yourself now that you're home all the time. So I definitely saw that increase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as Robert was saying, we've gotten a a lot of people self-referring because we don't, we don't really do promotion. We don't promote, but people kind of self-refer. And it's really interesting because the people that have been coming, they're so willing they're willing to come. I think there's this place right now where they know whether it's COVID or just all the pressures that they've had in the last six to seven months, they need a, an outside person. They need perspective because things are changing. And I think things that were normal, like pregnancy or jobs, it's not just a normal, exciting thing. There's a lot of parameters that are being controlled and overshadowing the experience. And so it's kind of like they need someone to navigate those things with them. And so we definitely have seen such a willingness for people that don't know us as as well as the 14 years of kids that we've had, but word of mouth, uh, a couple of uh, interactions that Mm -hmm. they're, they're getting, they're, they're, they're coming as couples, you know, uh, and wanting to, to get better. And isn't that interesting that adults need oftentimes the same things that our young people do. Go figure. And, and oftentimes we think, well, they're the adults. They have to have this figured out. You should know, 
and and we don't we don't always have these answers right and covid i think in particular has sh- has yep. shown or reminded us how much we do not always have control of things and um yep. And so I I have to ask, you know, Linda and Robert, the counselor in me has to ask, Mm -hmm. you are always so giving and you continue to pour into, into other people's hearts. So how do you fill your own cup to keep going? I work out. (laughs) Um, uh, I have ice cream three days a week, but I, I, mentorship fills me. Mentorship makes me feel alive, makes me feel like I'm doing something for a greater good. And it shows our son that we give away to other people and it's about other people. And our home is not for us. It's for the community. It's, it's always been about others. We, we both have a heart for that. And, and I think it's, it's one thing that's made us be so such a gift from God that we both have the same heart to do the same work because there's never a conflict But to be honest, we were just talking about this a couple of days ago. If we're not full, if our tanks aren't full, if he doesn't feel seen or I don't feel heard or we can't sit in a session, we can't give it away if we don't have it. So we can get an invitation for something and Robert will look at our calendar and we're like, we've had three sessions. No, we're not going anywhere else because we need time. And it could be just time him and I, it could be watching a movie, the three of us with our son and popcorn and candy. We're very intentional of not over committing. I have the tendency to overcommit. Amen. And uh, Robert brings me down because <laughs> I could be social all day long, right? And so over the years, I don't get offended. I recognize that our levels of what we need are different and I can get filled by sitting, this podcast will fill me today. A session will fill me, but at the same time, it exhausts me, right? Because of what people are sharing. So um, that's how I, that's how I fill my tank. I would say for me, I think my faith is very important to me. So I always start there. Like that is something that I, I, I start with because that grounds me. That gives me balance. It gives me perspective to start the day versus outward, which is important. But like you said, Gabby, like when you give, 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 eventually you're going to run dry. So I, I, I try to start there. And and then I start, uh, the next closest thing to that is with my family. So I always start inward. How is my home? How is my son? Am I investing in him? Am I spending time with him? Because if I'm spending time with all these kids in the community and coaching and mentoring, but that he's getting my crumbs and I feel like I've missed the point of why I've been given a son and, and a family. And so I, I start there. And then, with, then I go with my wife and, you know, Lynn is very driven. She's very driven and doesn't really know how to stop, you know, and, and, and I think that's a gift, but I think I, I really try to navigate making sure she's good and taking the temperature of that. And we, we try to fit in when we can um, date, date nights and stuff. COVID's affected that, but we've started cooking at home and just doing things that we normally wouldn't taking walks. And so that's something that I think we do is to try to make sure our cup is full and that we go, we give out of the, we call it out of the overflow that you're not trying to give and serve, but because you're so filled up, you're so full. Like, it's just natural. Like you just, your heart is filled and you're good. You're in a good space and you just, you just happens, you know? So, um, and when we kind of see we're butting heads or we're, you know, we realize, okay, maybe we need to pull back a little bit, like Linda was saying, and, you know, assess where are we at and what are we doing? And then, you know, um, but definitely trying to spend time with each other and, you know, just the little things, like for some people, it's not, that exciting or sexy, but it's like grocery shopping. Like, oh, like I like going grocery shopping with her. We were listening to a board, was it the board meeting last night, night. the district board meeting and they're at midnight listening together at the bottom. Like just little things, you know, I think making sure that we have time to do that. And I think why it's the little stuff because we have been in seasons where we haven't had the little stuff whether it was Robert coaching football and varsity and the late practices and the games or me being in a program and the late nights and the class and the homework. So the little stuff that goes along. If we just go down and grab a hamburger and a shake, like that's because we, we were in a season for three and a half years that for me, we didn't have that, you know, and it was like a thief in the night, you know, Ezra says, I didn't like mommy that was going to school because I never saw you, you mm-hmm. know, and, and it was true, you know, because he, he, I would, he said you would be gone when I would 
wake up and you wouldn't be home when I got went to bed. So the we're in the season right now because I just finished in the summer that we're just getting back reacquainted after being on the crazy, you know, mm-hmm. the crazy, crazy schedule. So uh, we're very simple, um, but we definitely like each other and enjoy being together. And sports is a big part of our lives all the time. Baseball, football, basketball. We enjoy coming home and just releasing with watching a game, just being mm-hmm. on the couch. So we always end our podcast with this other big question. <laughs> so I'll, I'll bat it to you or I pitch it to you guys. <laughs> yes. In that, in your sports, love of sports. So both of you in 10 years, mm-hmm. what do you hope that education learning looks like? You have a magic wand. You can make anything happen. What does it look like for our, our, our kiddos, our young, I call them my young, our young colleagues, like you were saying, Linda, they, they come back and there are our colleagues at some point. So what do you envision for, for them, for us in 10 years? That both the student and the teacher recognize how essential they are to each other, that teachers need students and students need teachers. It's a relationship that needs respect, humility, and trust that one can't happen without the other. And hopefully kids never like going to school and now everyone wants to be back in school. Mm. Teachers can't exist without students. Students can't exist without teachers. And sometimes by being without, you can see the value of things. And our world, I don't know how it will ever go back or what it will be like, but I hope that we value each other as an educational structure and system because you can't have one without the other. And to teach empty vessels is pointless. And so I hope that the students see the vessel of the teacher standing there and all that they can give you and impart in you to become the most amazing human being. And I hope the teacher sees in their 32, 24 students, the full vessel and the full potential and to recognize what they were at 12 is not who they are today. And to not pass judgment and condemnation for what the behavior is at the age of eight 12, 17, because what we become at 34, 35, 48 is very different. I, I have this picture of like a, a, just like a beautiful painting, you know? And so I, I, that's the best way I can describe it. Like in 10 years, I feel like I would be my heart's desire to see like this, this painting, this collage where every piece is utilized. Every piece um, every stroke of the pen, every, every stroke of the paintbrush is, is a value to that painting. And I think uh, sometimes on campuses, there's the haves and the have nots. There's this top tier of outgoing students that are, that are easily identified and, and, and they're, they're the campus leaders or the ASB. Or the, and there's this whole other subgroup of kids that kind of just go through it. And so my hope is that in 10 years that, um, Kids are kids are are developed, and kids are are helping create lessons, and kids are creating clubs that their voice kind of rises. You're seeing this this movement in our society where like young people are they're rising up, and so I, I, I my heart is that that's channeled in a good way um, to help shift what it looks what campuses look like um, to break some of that traditional norm and let the kids' voices be heard from from a young age. You know, raising up first graders that are leaders on their campuses that are, that are creative, that are, you know, not just in sports and science, STEM sports and art, but like just different things, entrepreneurship and technology and, 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 you know, caring for the community, like that their voice is heard, you know, so that, that's my heart is that that's what education is, is like, what do you want to become? And here's how, here's an, here's a forum to help you get there versus, Here's four paths to become four things that are kind of put on kids versus what do you want to be? And let's help you get there. If I could wave a wand, it would be, it would be that. 
because I think that would also excite, excite educators, you know, like, wow, I can really help people become what they want to be. I think that's, that's the essence of what teaching and mentorship is, is, is just helping somebody become what's inside of them. And so what a tool education can be if it, it goes down that path. So, yeah. And in doing so, you fill your own cup as a teacher, as a counselor, yeah. as a coach. Yeah. It's yeah. been such a great pleasure. I feel like we need to bring you guys back and see where we're at you need their year. own podcast you need your own <laughs> podcast i you yeah, know check the schedule yes. check the, 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 yeah. not putting any more on your plate but it's yeah. just it's just really wonderful to um see you know two people number one that you like you said it was it wasn't an easy road but yeah. you you're where you are now and you keep moving forward and you know i think at the core you can definitely see that both of you have this you know, a purpose that you both have. And, you know, it, you're very fortunate to have that for your lives. Yeah. You know, if we could give students that, that sense of purpose from the beginning in their own lives, yeah. it's just how much better we would be. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And now our closing thoughts. Gabby, I think what really struck me about Linda and Robert Aside from the fact that they're just such a wonderful couple, I mean, you could see that um, in, in our interview, is when Linda said that she felt seen. Mm -hmm. um, she felt seen in elementary, and then she didn't feel seen in middle school or high school. And I, I think I mentioned in the, our conversation that I felt like she was my soul sister in some of the things that she was saying, because I think when you go through, um, when you're first gen, it is such an accomplishment and you have to do it on the backs of so many people and you need so much help to do that. Mm. But that whole process and that whole journey of going through school, um, really to get you to where you are, if, if, you, if, you, um, if that's your final destination, it means that somebody saw you along the way, like they had to, mm -hmm. because I really don't think that you'd be able to do that unless somebody saw you. And I can absolutely point out the people in my life, including my mother, um, who helped propel me toward the ability, you know, and the privilege to be able to, to have that experience. And so hearing Linda say that and then knowing what she's doing with her husband I feel like she's trying to see kids every day mm -hmm. so she can, you know, if, if it's just one, one student that she's able to connect with that she can help propel their potential. Mm -hmm. Just, it was just amazing, amazing conversation. Yeah. They're both amazing, um, loving, caring people, you know, and I've had the privilege of knowing them for, for several years now. Um, and like Linda had said, I, I, I knew her before they actually were married. And so to see her before and then after, uh, you know, and just changes that come with that growth that comes with that um, different experiences they both had. But when I really reflect on what they both shared, I thought, you know, it's, it's the, the way that they approach their work is from such an, an honest, good place. Um, you know, we, we've chatted when they were first launching their, their nonprofit and thinking, here's what we want to do. And, and they met with me, like I had these answers. <laughs> I thought, why are you asking me? I've never done a nonprofit, but you know, here's some, some things that I, that I do know, um, you know, just to consider if you're going to launch, um, in this direction. And one thing I realized with them, it was really wanting to just give, um, and, and one thing I thought is one thing I have learned from people is you do have, that's a great place to be, but you also need to make sure that you've got the stability to be able to do that. And so with Linda and Robert, they just naturally have always done that. And then I finally now created a formal structure to what they've been doing for years, which to them seemed very natural. It was, well, we just give it away. Yeah, you're still giving it away, but now there's some structure you have your nonprofit, you can secure stakeholders and, you know, possible funding to continue that work. Because a lot of the folks that we've connected with on the podcast this season and that you and I know outside of work, Lisa, they do so much, but outside of their regular 40 hour a week job. And I'm always amazed and think, oh my goodness, they work, you know, regular nine to five. And then 
their entrenched in the community as advocates and their mentors. And that's Linda and Robert. They have their jobs and then they do this on the side, which is this mentoring and coaching and, and really just being um, a positive person in people's lives. So I'm always amazed at their ability to continue to give. That's why I had to ask that question about how do you fill your own cup when you, you give it to others. And so I know Linda and Robert find it very replenishing to give. And like Linda said, she's been the recipient of that reciprocal, loving, uh, supporting relationship with her mentees at a time where it was most needed. I already knew they were amazing people. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping our listeners now realize this is why I gravitate towards cool people because Linda and Robert are just genuine and authentic uh, they're great parents. They're a great couple. They just want to continue to give. And it comes from a place of love. And, and I think, especially in the time that we're in right now, with everything happening uh, in, in our society, you know, not to sound like a Hallmark card, but maybe if we just approached it with, you know, a sense of love, approach people with a sense of love, see them, um, just recognize that they exist. Believe it or not, that that can mean the world to that other person. We always say that about kids, but I don't think we remind adults that oftentimes adults we work with are at work or in the community and they don't feel seen. Um, I think oftentimes of um, our custodial staff at school sites, our front office staff, our cafeteria staff, uh, you know, and, and we all remember during classified employees week, but that is not the only week that they are amazing um, mentors kind of informally. You know, every time I'd be on school campuses, you know, the, the, I'd watch the custodial staff and they just have a way of coming in and out of rooms, always with a good attitude and kids just gravitate because they're positive energy and there's no judgment. But oftentimes I, I wonder, how do we see these folks on our staff? Do we see them? Do we value them? Um, and so again, if we just approach people with a sense of love, maybe we can not change the whole world, but change our little corner of it. There's so much physics in that, Gabby, that you just said. <laughs> I mean, My Hallmark like, card saying? Your Hallmark card just kind of went into the, the science realm in a way. And I know people are probably thinking that, how, how are you pulling science out of that? But it's like, you know, there's this idea of strange attractors. And you mentioned even magnets when we were talking about in our conversation. And, you know, thinking about like, we actually don't see those attractive bonds, but they do attract. And so if you could, as just a person in a school, like you're saying, you're bonded to whether you believe it or not, or whether you want to see those bonds to all of the people that you work with, all the, the students that you have, the families that you have. And it's almost sometimes like, like we fight against having those relationships because of whatever might have happened in, in your past. And relationships are hard. Mm -hmm. A lot of us come from traumatic spaces where you know, the idea of a healthy relationship is not necessarily one, you know, we'll, it's just easier to put our defense mechanism. But what if we were to embrace like Robert and Linda have so clearly like raw allowed themselves to embrace those connections? It, it, what an amazing place we would be in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for introducing them to me. I can't wait to interview our, our final speaker, our final interviewee. Yes. So our next episode will be our 10th and final for this season, but we're, we've got a lot more stored. So stay tuned. But on that note, that does it for us this week. I'm Gabby. And I'm Lisa. Thanks for listening.